My name is Mark Sandberg, and I'm a professor in the Department of Scandinavian and the Film and Media Department. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you today my colleague and former dissertation advisor, Carol Clover, from many years ago. Uh, so we have known each other and worked together for many years as both student mentor and colleagues uh, in the Department of Scandinavian. Uh, Carol is the Emerita Professor of the class of 1936 and has had appointments in the Departments of Scandinavian and Complet and Rhetoric and Film Studies. So I think to start with, it would probably make sense to have you talk a little bit about your background and your early years. Not so much to create a biography, but maybe to talk about the way that um, being a native Californian and growing up in California, um, experiencing the California public education system and all of that, how that plays an important role in your connection to UC Berkeley. So maybe start off by telling us a little bit about your early years and. Um, well, thank you, Mark, for that. Um, I, yes, I am a Californian, born and raised in California, as were both my parents. Uh, this is kind of unusual in Berkeley to meet Californians, but uh, I and my brothers um, grew up in Sacramento uh, during the war years. Um, and some of my earliest memories were of sirens and uh, bomb scares, because don't forget we on the Pacific Coast were also at war. Um, and um, my father, who comes from Los Angeles, was a radio engineer and his, he installed and serviced radio stations up and down the, the uh, West Coast, but mainly in California. And this counted as civil defense during World War II. But the minute the war was over, uh, we fled the city and went to the country, my mother's uh, family's uh, ranching area up there. And so I spent the rest of my life um, in rural California, Shasta County, um, and um, it was a world of, you know, it was, we lived on a small ranch right next to a large family ranch, and it was a world of cattle and horses and crops and, you know. Um, I, was, I grew up in a very musical family, and we had uh, other, we knew other musical people, so we did a lot of uh, playing together. Um, and the other family we were closest to was another family that had fled Santa Cruz during the war and moved to North, and that was the Rhodes family. And they were, we called each other our God families, even though we were not technically that. But my God sister Lynn, I have two, Lynn and Jean, but uh, are still in my, very much in my life. Um, so it was a rural life, but we made occasional trips to the to cities you know to los angeles to visit, visit my father's family or to san francisco to go to the symphony um, and to berkeley actually because my parents both had friends in berkeley so so i knew i knew california cities as well i went to a one-room school a tiny quaint building that eight grades in one room had a little bell on the top <laughs> And um, I went, and uh, here's a little story. In 1948, when I was eight years old, um, there was a bad win winter storm that came and it blew part of the school roof off. And so my father, who was president of the school board, consulted with my mother, who was the president of the PTA, and uh, <laughs> they went to the county office to ask what could be done about this. And the county said, this is not a county issue, this is a state issue. So um, you need to go to Sacramento. So my father and I drove to Sacramento, which was a four hour drive or something, waited in a line in a building and got to the window and they were interested in hearing this story. And they said, just wait a minute. And the guy at the window disappeared and came back after a while and he said, uh, we think this is something that the governor would like to, <laughs> you should discuss with the governor. And it was clear they, they saw it photo op in this, right? So we were walked over to the governor's mansion. Um, 
and all the, the Sacramento Bee photographers was out, were out watching this, which I still have pictures of it, and went in and talked with the governor. And this is Earl Warren, <laughs> or Jarl Varen was his birth name. He's Norwegian background. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he gave a speech. I was seated on the side of his desk for the photographers, and he gave me a little speech about how uh, even though I went to this tiny one-room school, I was getting the same education as the kids in San Francisco and Los Angeles, and it was the best school system, you know, uh, school system in, in, the, in, the, in the world, or certainly in the U.S., and he said, possibly the world, he said. And when you get, you can go to junior college, you can go to college, you can go to the University of California, you can go to Berkeley. <laughs> So I, I think of Earl Warren now and then. And that, that was kind of at the height of the California system, right? It really when it was, was really yeah. functioning. Yeah. It was. Did did you feel like when you were in Shasta County that you were um, that you didn't have access to everything, or did you feel like things were anything that you wanted to learn or do you oh, could do? Well, not anything, but but lots of things. Um, for one thing. Oh, I should mention that when I was in elementary school, a bookmobile came once a week, and you could check out books and so forth. And an instrument mobile came once a month. Yeah. You could check out any <laughs> instrument you wanted um, and try it out for a month and then turn it in and get another instrument. So my brothers and I tried out all kinds of things. One of my brothers tried out, little kid brother tried out a, a French horn and he could hardly hold it up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, it was, so we had just incredible, and we had a great library, the wonderful public library in Reading, which was a hmm. bit of a drive, but still, we would go there regularly. So, mm -hmm. no, I did not feel deprived of yeah. um, being in the country. So when you decided to go off to college, you moved to the Bay Area, and maybe it'd be interesting to hear you talk a little bit about um, what you saw as your possible areas of study? What did you think you might study yeah. when you went to college? And how did that turn out? Um, I, I assumed, I just took for granted that I would do music um, because that had been so, loomed so large in my, in my childhood. And I applied to San Francisco State University and the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. They had a joint program. So I was accepted into that, so I came to San Francisco for that. Um, it didn't work out very well because at, uh, after a couple of weeks, I was assigned an advisor um, in the conservatory part of this. And um, the advisor said, which of the three lines do you want to do? Do you want to do uh, there's the, the lines are, he told me about the three lines, and he said there's uh, composition and um, musicology and performance. And I said, composition, because that was the whole point for me. And he said, well, that's not open to girls, huh. so you'll have to choose one of the other two. And I didn't want to ch choose the other two, so I stopped going to my classes at the conservatory and paid attention to my classes over at San Francisco State. Um, and I happened to be taking a, a class over there on a required undergraduate course and in the English department, and it was in the history of world epic. Okay, so we read Gilgamesh, you know, the Iliad, the Aeneid, um, uh, the Odyssey, on marching on until we, the last one on the list was Njal Saga. And that one just blew me into Kingdom Come. I just, that was just the best thing I'd ever read in my life. I really loved it. And so I went to the library and uh, found other sagas. You know, I looked up in the card catalog and I found other sagas and I read those too. And I just absolutely loved that. Um, but uh, the whole thing sort of stopped short when I, I, I mean, I got married at that point, um, just six days after I turned 20. Um, and my husband was accepted to Berkeley as a graduate student in sociology. So we moved to Berkeley. And um, in 1961, I had my first child. 
and uh, that's my daughter Greta. And I had a second child in the following year, 1962. <laughs> it's my son Joshua. But I was taking courses during that time. Uh, I was allowed to sit in on courses, and I, at some point along the way, got accepted as a student at Berkeley, so I was actually taking courses toward graduation. So you took courses before you were actually transferred officially, is that right? I, was, yeah. I took one course before uh -huh. I was officially transferred, and then I yeah. did, started doing other courses. And then I would started taking you know, the required courses, so I took um, lots, three bio, serious biology courses and one physics course. Physics was from Edward Teller, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, I remember it was a huge class held in the Wheeler Auditorium. And I remember um, that we, we all, we had TAs, we had sections, and I'd go to, went to my TA's office and wants to ask a question. And as I was waiting to see my TA, I saw that outside his door, there was a little sign that said, you can lead an undergraduate to knowledge, but you can't make her think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, mostly I took biology courses because that was, I seemed, I felt kind of predestined to do biology. One of my brothers had done biology at Berkeley in graduate school and the other brother also got a BA in biology and growing up in the country it just seemed like the natural thing to do. Um, so so why am I not in interviewing a famous professor of biology, biology right I'll now? I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> because I was going to apply to graduate school in biology. I did my undergraduate biology required courses and I was advised to go introduce myself to the chair of the department to you know warn him that I would be applying and sort of brag about who, you know, my background and so forth. So I got all spiffed up and I, I made an appointment and I got all spiffed up and went over there one day and uh, told him my story and he said, well, that all sounds very good, but uh, um, unfortunately, we think it's uh, not fair to the taxpayers of California uh, to have girls as graduate students because they end up getting married and having children. And I thought I'd been handed my trump card. I said, I've already had my children. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, well, then you should be home taking care of them. Lose-lose. <laughs> <laughs> so, so back to Njal Saga. I went to the Scandinavian, I, you know, I had taken enough, I'd taken Swedish already because I wanted to study Old Norse on the side. So I, I did that. And I was, by 1963, um, I was, I was, I was actually divorced, separated and divorced in the mid 60s. So I was on my own with, with my kids after that. And, um, and I did Scandinavian as a graduate student. And then, so you started in graduate school and you were a single mother of two kids, uh, how did that work? I mean, how did you navigate that um, through graduate school? Well, I, th I th one thing to talk about here is the uh, financial support, uh, because it was, um, it was a, you know, it was a heyday of the Cold War, right? And the Congress had passed this, these lavish, uh, sort of uh, things about uh, uh, support for students who are studying strategic languages. So, and Scandinavian languages counted as strategic because they were not Slavic, but they were on the edge. So, you know, um, I studied Swedish and Old Norse and Old High German, Middle High German, and I, I actually did also take two semesters of Russian and one, I even took one semester of Old Church Slavonic. And I got really very considerable support from, uh, just from the, the, that Fulbright Act uh, yeah, that's for me always, and my kids. It's always surprised me that the Scandinavian languages got pulled into that I know. because it seemed like they were the third way languages that were outside and outside yeah. the Cold War, but uh, 
I guess the proximity was the reason. Yeah, yeah, I, and yeah that's what they said. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't think people in French got them. Right, people exactly. In yeah. got them. I, it was really Scandinavian. And I wasn't the only one who was profiting from this. Yeah. Um, and you had, a, you had a Fulbright to Sweden, right? Yes, and in 1965, 66. And uh -huh. I, again, I went there as a single mother, but um, there was childcare. Swedish childcare was you know, famous worldwide, and it was truly great. My kids still remember it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for example, they had, at the childcare center, they had mini kitchens. Uh -huh. With little tiny stoves and little tiny refrigerators and tables and chairs and <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so maybe we could talk a little bit about the intellectual fields that you started to develop while you were in graduate school and and how they interest you. So you've said a little bit about the Icelandic sagas and especially Njal's saga and why they caught your interest, but maybe you could say a little bit more. Uh, for the audience and explain a little bit about the Icelandic sagas and what makes them a kind of fascinating area of study. Okay, well, I, yeah, in the Scandinavian department, I, again, it was Njal's saga that got me all into this. Um, and Njal's saga, there are lots of Icelandic sagas, sagas that were written down in the early Middle Ages, and they, but they describe events from the settlement of Iceland in about 800 to the Christianization of Iceland in about the year 1000. So that 250 year period about was, is completely fascinating historically and, um, and, and, and in terms of the history of literature. I mean, the sagas are unlike anything else. They're, they range in length from 50 pages to, well, Njal Saga, over 300 pages. And so they, they, they're they epics in a way. They tell about the founding of a country and so on and so forth. Except there's something wrong with them as epics. They're in prose. And epics are all in verse. It's a definition almost of an epic. So that makes the Icelandic sagas, they're going to be Europe's only prose epics or its first novels. And that just fascinated me in itself. And, um, but also just reading the sagas, it's, they're fantastic reading. I mean, just to learn about a culture uh, that in that much detail, it's about everyday life. They're, they're not epics that are about grand wars and so forth. They're about families and um, squabbles in the neighborhood. And, uh, and, and you were also really interested in how these long forms came out of oral storytelling, right? And about how, what the relationship between the written form was yes. and, the, and the kind of kernels of oral storytelling that preceded uh, them. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely interested in that. I've done a lot of work on that, but yeah. it's kind of technical to talk about. Okay. Um, but I will say this, that um, one of the things I love and still love about the sagas is that the they're so understated. Uh, they're, you know, they never will talk. There's never any flamboyant about language, about people's feelings or anything like that. It's just, and everything is subtle. So, and that's true, but it's humor too. There are all these understated jokes, you know, that are in them. And uh -huh. I remember, and sometimes you can read a saga in the tw in now and once or twice or three times, and then. And then you finally get it, you know. And I remember once that that happened to me. I would read Njal Saga six times or something, and I read it for the seventh time, and and I I I got the joke for the first time, <laughs> chapter sixty-three, I think. And it was like, you did know, it, somebody it. in Iceland told a joke, and somebody in California laughed a thousand times. Uh, that's later. right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I took Old Norris from you when I first came to Berkeley and started graduate school. And um, I remember how infectious your enthusiasm was <laughs> for the sagas and, and, and uh, you know, sort of felt the tug of medieval studies even as I was more of a modern student. And I also remember that you 
used to go around evangelizing for Nyal Saga and giving people copies, actually. Yes. There yeah. are probably um, people who will watch this that have gotten a copy of Nyal Saga <laughs> from you. And, and I also gave one to my son at one point, and he was totally enthralled oh, by it. I think and, I remember that. Um, so, so there really is something um, kind of uh, engaging about this material for anybody who encounters it, I think. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, I think you also got interested in legal procedure yes. by reading the sagas and did yes. some work on that. Maybe yeah. you could say a bit more about your interest in law. Uh, yeah, well, the sagas are about often about lawsuits. People either feud if they have a disagreement or they go take it to court outdoors. Our, Iceland is actually the world's first parliamentary democracy, and that was during this era. Um, yeah, the legal, and it's just fascinating to see the first instance of the adversarial trial, because the Icelandic trials are the ancestors of our trials in the Anglo-American world. And, uh, you know, that, that was a society, they, it's a kind of legal system that came into being because there was no autocrat at the top, there was no king. So people had to sort it out themselves, so they cre created this legal system. Um, and Nalsaga has a trial that goes on for 30 pages. <laughs> and people who do the history of um, legal process all know that trial. It's very well known. It's not boring either. <laughs> no, it's not boring. It's really interesting. And I, uh, that made me so interested in law that I actually got I started thinking, making other kinds of speculations about kind of the social consequences of that legal system. And I, I, mean, I think there are lots of literary consequences in our world. I think detective narrative comes from the underlying legal system. Um, and, and, and certain other things too. But I was, I was really quite taken with that. And, uh, started at some point, I thought I would write a book on, on this, on the effects of the adversarial mm -hmm. structure. And yeah. then I started going, wherever I went in the world, I started going, finding courtrooms and going to trials. <laughs> <laughs> so you, I've been to trials in, I think, 13 countries. <laughs> and, and you had a fundamental experience on jury duty that also yeah, well, contributed that, to this oh, as yeah, well. Oh, yeah, well, that too. Yeah. 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 But I did want to say that the most interesting trial I went to in another country was in South Africa because that's both the Dutch and the English. Hmm. And that's two different legal systems that got smushed together there. And hmm. they've created this kind of bastard trial. So, so that was really fascinating too. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so this is gonna sound like an arbitrary next question, which is, that another field of interest that you developed during your time in college and graduate school was in film. And that we'll get back to uh, how this all fits together. But back in the 60s, when you were in an undergrad, I'm assuming there weren't actually film studies departments anywhere. Not, that, not um, that was just an emerging institutional structure at that point. Yeah. Um, often they were in English departments or complete departments or other places, which was... I, th I don't think film was even taught as a subject in those departments in, for quite a while, actually. Yeah. Um, so, so how did you become interested in film on the side, so to speak? Okay, well, I, when I first moved to San Francisco, okay, um, in 59, I was living out near my the Conservatory of Music and San Francisco State. The conservatory was out, out there then in the west part of San Francisco. And there was the Surf Theater. I don't know if you know the Surf Theater. Uh, it was an, an art film theater, although I had no idea what that concept was at the time. But I just, I knew that people were, the cool kids in San Francisco <laughs> State were going to f the cinema. So I, <laughs> so I went myself to the Surf. And they were showing wild strawberries. It's the first 
And I also, because I grew up in the country, I barely had been to movie theaters, just, yeah. you know, maybe five or six times in my life. Um, and so going to the surf theater and seeing this amazing movie with subtitles, I'd never seen subtitles, was really kind of mind boggling. And I wanted to see more. So I started going to movies and um, I got married and moved to Berkeley. And um, uh, there were lots of little theaters in Berkeley too, on Telegraph Avenue, mm -hmm. on Euclid Avenue, uh, two more, three more on Shattuck Avenue, little ones were talking art theaters. Yeah. And I really, uh, I really loved those. Um, I, it just struck me that 1959 would be the year that Wild Strawberries had just come out. It, it <laughs> and so you exactly were not right. seeing it as an art film. It no, was the I, latest thing yeah, right. from Sweden. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Interesting. No, I really, I really loved them. Yeah. So, so, so let's uh, start maybe talking about how you started your career as a professor. And when you were finishing up your dissertation, yeah. you got this uh, contact from Harvard about a position there. So yeah. say a bit about that. And then... Yeah, well, I, I came to the point, I was writing my dissertation, not finished, um, but there, uh, there were, I think, three jobs available then sort of in my field, early Northern Europe, and uh, one of them was at the University of Washington, one of them the University of Texas, and one of them was at Harvard. And I think they were interested in me, and Harvard, I think they were all three interested in me, but of course, I'm the big H, right? I mean, I wanted to go to Harvard. And I actually got a counter offer from Berkeley when I got the Harvard offer, which was a better offer. But you know, again, the big H, I wanted to go there. So my kids and I packed up and went to Harvard. Hmm. And, and it was in comparative literature and Germanic. So you finished up writing the dissertation after you were there, is yes, that right? Yes, yeah. I was, um, uh, it was horrible. Now the first year I was just busy teaching, but the summer, the first summer I had there, Einar Haugen, a professor, an older professor, let me use his study in the Widener Library for the summer. And that was fantastic. And my kids also went to California to stay with my parents for a while. So I finished my dissertation then. Huh. And then you started off teaching medieval materials and Scandinavian materials. And um, how did the film part of this uh, start up at Harvard? Um, well, before I do that, let me just say, first of all, I did not, I did not love Harvard. Um, I, I knew some great people in it, and the department was very kind to me, but I was, I got the California treatment, and... <laughs> what was that? <laughs> oh, it's, you're from California, where's your surfboard? Uh -huh. You're from California, can you think? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was harder to be a Californian at Harvard than a woman. I would say. I just took really? endless grief from being from California. Huh. Um, yeah, I mainly taught um, medieval Scandinavian, although, and also some modern courses, Ibsen and Strindberg a couple mm -hmm. times. Um, but one day that was early on, actually, like within the first week that I was there, there was a knock on my office door and it was a man who introduced himself as being the head of the Carpenter Center at Harvard, which was, I think, then an art museum, but I think it's now called a Center of Visual Arts or something like that. And it was, he said, we understand that you do cinema. <laughs> I said, well, sort of. And he said, we want to teach a course. Would you be willing to teach a course? We can get you all the films to see in advance and you know it's Harvard yeah uh, they had deep pockets so I said sure and so they I was going to teach they asked me to teach a course on Ingmar Bergman so I they uh, got all the films and that was films like reels of film you know yeah and looking at an old projectors but they brought all the films in advance for me to see 
And then again, when I taught the course, they brought all the films in. It was just incredible kind of um, infrastructure for teaching. Yeah. So that was, from then on, I taught film and medieval. I've taught those things together always. Yeah, I know we've talked about how, in some ways, the filmmakers like Bergman were the Trojan horse that allowed film studies to come into the yeah. academy because they were philosophically you know, challenging and, That's right. and that things like genre films would not have been able That's to right. start. You that, know, that's as, exactly yeah. right. They, yeah. the genre film came later. That was yeah. kind of trashier. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, um, I don't know if you remember this too, that when I was a graduate student, then we did a whole semester of independent study together on Ingmar Bergman that led to my first published article. And yes, so we kind yes. of relived all of the yes. the Bergman work that you'd done up to that <laughs> point. And you handed that Bergman course off to me and I handed it off to Linda Rugg and it's been taught in different <laughs> ways in the taught. department. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think we've arrived at, at the the kind of question of destiny, which is the one that you've been asked many times, which is how can you possibly be working in such different fields as the sagas and film studies? People think these are probably opposite fields in some yeah. ways. Yeah. And and I've always enjoyed your explanation of that. So let me uh, <laughs> sort, of, sort of ask the question and, and invite you to do that, yeah. Yes, I've been asked that question uh, countless times. How can you work in two such opposite fields? And, uh, and my answer is always the same. They're not opposites. They're the same thing, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, the answer to that is, is, a, is a long answer, I'm afraid. But it's, um, you know, they are, um, there's a term of, Especially since I work on genre films, mm -hmm. you know, so it's genre films and my, my medieval stuff. That's those are very similar, same kind of sets of questions and so forth because because they're generic because they're typed and, and you're looking. It's the art of art in a closed field is uh -huh. the, the answer. It's how do you w within all the constraints and the rules of the genre. How does it? How does it? perform kind of in its own way and sometimes brilliantly. I mean, yeah. you know, there are great genre films, great sagas. Um, yeah, it's yeah. that creativity within constraint that right, becomes exactly. interesting, right? right? Yeah. And I, you know, in music, I, I, uh, I love classical music and go to it a lot, um, but I also love popular music, and that's mainly what I play now, uh, is just play by ear with friends and improvise, and that's art within a closed field, you know, it's the same old set of chords, yeah. but everything else is a little different. I mean, one of the, I think one of the really powerful ideas that I picked up from you when I was in graduate school was just how interesting it was to think comparatively about versions of different things, oh, yeah. and yeah. and how that really opened up a way of, of thinking um, analytically about about form and um, so I think um, that's you know definitely one of the legacies of our conversations together um, um, so maybe say a little bit about men women and chainsaws and <laughs> and then uh, you know this is one of the uh, I remember the moment that you uh, showed me that Princeton University had come out with their centenary edition of the you know, 100 interesting books from Princeton University Press on the 100th year. And there alongside Einstein's theory of relativity was <laughs> men, women, and chainsaws. And I've, I've often loved telling that story to people. Um, and, and how does that fit into these same kind of concerns about generic form and about the kind of virtuoso performance of generic form. And then maybe another field that has been really important to you, which is about thinking about gender and gender theory. So. Oh, that's big. But before I go there, let me just say that 
um, Princeton, I, I, when I turned in my manuscript to Princeton, that's a classy university press, right? Uh, and the, I'm told this by somebody who was there on the board when they, and, and they said, what, you know? <laughs> and then one, and then, then one of them said, is that Carol Clover the medievalist? And, and he said, yes, it is. And he said, we'll take it. <laughs> I was told that. I don't know if it's true. Yeah. I hope it's true. If I, An, another, I'll find out. When yeah, thing another <laughs> Trojan horse story, right? <laughs> so. Well, first of all, to make the obvious point, um, the third chapter of that book, it's called Getting Even, and it's all about re revenge movies. And um, that's straight out, that comes straight out of Icelandic sagas. The whole logic of, you know, of uh, discord and revenge is, I mean, that's a whole huge subject and it's, it drives all of our popular movie culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's, revenge can be, you know, it, even a, a, a movie for teenagers about you know high school is a revenge can yeah, usually a revenge, film, got yeah. revenge story. Mean, and, mean girl stories are revenge <laughs> exactly. stories. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean it's very hard to find a, a genre film that is not ultimately about revenge, getting even in one way or another. Uh huh. It yeah. may not be violent at all, but yeah. Um. Yeah. Well. Um. So. Uh, the other story I remember about men, women, and chainsaws is that um, one of the video stores here in in uh, Berkeley um, told you one time when you were in there that when people come came in asking for low budget horror videos, that they would also hand out one of your articles that that <laughs> yeah. was also yeah. brought into that book, and that that one of the things that really strikes me about that book is that it had such um, explanatory power for people who'd been sort of engaged with this genre of, of horror film and, and maybe felt like they were fans of it. But what you did there in, in talking about it in terms of gender theory really laid out a structure that, that um, I know sometimes you feel like gets too flattened according to the yeah, argument that you yeah. want to make. But um, do you have any thoughts about sort of the afterlife of that book and, and what it's meant? And um, um, Well, uh, I mean, it's still going. Yeah. I'm still getting royalty checks. It's unbelievable. It's 1992. Yeah. Um, and I think it's the best selling uh, book Princeton's ever had. Huh. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I, I was, I'm astonished to this day. I can't believe it because that was not the plan. It was supposed to be an academic book and film, and it took off. And the, of course, the term "final girl" took off, and it, uh, in 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 ways that <laughs> in yeah. ways that crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, but there, are, you know, there's a movie called "Final Girl." There's a there are, it's a rock group called Final Girls, you know, on and on and on. Yeah, but even even students in my classes now that are interested in trans theory are still going back to that and looking yeah. at that yeah. kind of gender yeah. crossing that you're doing in that book. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so why don't we turn to your life on the Berkeley campus now and kind of the institutional um, roles that you've played. So say a bit about the two departments or three, three departments that yeah. you've been in, I guess, yeah. at different times. Yeah, I was in uh, Scandinavian. I was hired in Scandinavian, but then joint with comparative literature because that's where film was. Uh -huh. And then film shifted to rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So I followed it to rhetoric. And then film became its own department. And I never went that far because I was close to retirement. That I didn't want to get involved. I might have to chair it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the other thing about being a small department yes. is how much time you spend uh, 
running things. You yes. Know? You never get, you know perfectly well, you yeah. never get a break. <laughs> I think I ended up chairing that department because you did. I mean, maybe because not everybody on the faculty here is in two small departments like that, it might be interesting just to hear a little bit about what that means about turn taking and about about you know it's both both the advantages of that yeah. you know openness and flexibility of not being sort of deep within a large department yeah. Yeah. and a discipline that goes with it so it gives you a kind of flexibility yeah. but um, how did you experience that as you were in those departments well it's yeah I was in two small departments although I tried to play them off against each other now and then, so <laughs> not do two jobs but you know serving as under you had to you know, in a small department of five or six people, you have to have an undergraduate advisor, a graduate advisor, a chair, a vice, blah, blah, blah. And so that means you're always doing something or two things. And if you're in a split department, as I was, then that was even more of a thing. But I nonetheless, actually, one reason I, um, well, I also served on academic senate committees. I, I, I was on uh, admissions, um, DIVCO. Committee on committees at some uh, point. Com committee on committees, academic yeah. planning. Yeah. And of course the budget committee, which I was on for not the usual three, but four years, because I had to substitute um, for someone. And um, that was all fascinating. And But when I was doing, once I was chair of the budget committee, I didn't have to do any departmental stuff. Yeah. So that was yeah, nice. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> I mean, I've heard you talk in glowing terms about budget committee, which has always been a mystery to me, but tell yeah. me why that was uh, a, like a rewarding. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, per first of all, it has a lot of power at, at the university and you're making important decisions. You're dealing, you're dealing at the level of the chancellor. You're talking with the chancellor, okay? Um, and, um, and that, you know, that meant you had to think hard about things and learn things and know a lot. And, and that, was, that was challenging, and I, I very much appreciated that. I, and I also came to uh, appreciate and truly believe in, I'm a deep believer, in shared governance, which is a University of California thing that dates from, I think, 1917 or about then when there was this kind of faculty revolution uh, and in which the res resolution was that they would set up a structure so that it would be the faculty would and the, the uh, administration would be sort of equal partners in all of important decision making. So, and the budget committee, of course, on, at Berkeley is the most important of, on that side of the thing. So it was, it just felt gratifying to be dealing with important business and mm. uh, de and also just meeting all the people <laughs> that you meet on the budget committee from all over campus. I mean, I made some very good friends on the budget committee, um, including Steve Glickman, by the way, who just uh, died two years ago, but who has also had a legacy interview, I believe. Yes, he has. I've seen it. Um, and so, I, I imagine the exposure to the research that's going on in oh, all the different yeah, parts of campus absolutely. is really interesting as well. Really yeah. fascinating, yeah. yeah. And although you don't have time to read somebody's incredibly interesting looking book, or, <laughs> but you can at least leaf through it and, you know, and find out. It's, yeah, absolutely. It's totally yeah. interesting. Um, so, You've, you've had a number of career awards, and um, are there any that you're particularly proud of? You have a, I'm, I mean, going back to the wild strawberries uh, uh, <laughs> oh, reference yes. earlier on there, for those who don't know the film, there's a very famous on, a honorary doctorate yeah. ceremony that's being done at the end. And I remember when you were given an honorary doctorate in Lund that yeah. you were reliving that film right. as well exactly. in some way. I mean, how, how did that in feel? In the same cathedral. In I the got, same got, cathedral yeah, right. with the same ritual. And, and the same um, the, the hat. And, not yeah. the hat, but I had a little 
what do you call it? Little oh, uh, 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 laurel wreaths. Yes, the yes, laurel wreath, yes. Which I still have. It's all dried up. Uh, I still have okay, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you had honorary doctorates from Sweden and from Iceland also yeah. for the work on medieval saga material. Yeah. Um, but are there, are there other awards that are? Uh, I've gotten some other awards, uh, but I, I think the one that matters most to me actually is the Distinguished Service Award on campus. Um, and why, why is that more meaningful than others maybe? Um, it's an acknowledgement for of all of the, the work I did and you know all the committees I served on and so forth. So I, I actually very appreciative of that. It um, I think people who work in the academic senate often feel like there's a lot that is is done invisibly or behind the scenes or that just is necessary to keep the university going and I imagine it probably right. felt like bringing that out into the open a little bit yeah. with an acknowledgement was gratifying. Yeah. 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 I've also been on um, sort of search committees uh, uh, for the search committee for the chancellor, for example. And, and that was hard work, but really interesting. And um, one of the things I learned is how hard it is to, um, to hire a chancellor at Berkeley. And why, why? Because people from private schools at our level, you know, the best private universities, uh, are not used to dealing with the academic senate because again, shared governance. And they're, they're you know, we've had some from private schools and they screw it up usually, yes. frankly. Um, and People from public schools also don't understand shared governance because it makes us different from the University of Texas, the University of Minnesota, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I would I enjoyed that service too. Yeah, yeah. So one of the sort of early forms of gender studies on campus was in a women's studies uh, program, and I know you had some role in that. Can you say a little bit about your involvement with uh, women's studies and what it was like yeah. then? Well, there was no women's studies at all at Berkeley. There was nothing. And uh, I think people in the English department might have been teaching sort of courses on women in the novel or something like that, occasional things like that on campus. But otherwise, it was nothing. And other universities were forming women's studies programs. So some of us started thinking we should, too. And so and we, a lot of women got together and we, uh, you know, we got up, came up with ideas and we also started a, a pro, we wanted, we requested three things, I remember. We wanted a place for women to go on campus, a place that would be for women only. And we wanted a, a department. And what else did we want? We wanted... Um, Research money. Oh yeah, research money. Yeah, money for research and especially on women's um, issues, and that was going. And then, uh, lots of people got involved in this, and from lots of different angles, and with different people had different stakes in it. So it became kind of a mess. And I did run uh, at the the proto research unit for a while, um, and then stepped down and let somebody take that over. But you know, it did finally end up with a department, a full yeah. regular department. So, yeah. so um, you've had opportunities to leave Berkeley at different times. Um, why did you decide to stay here for your career? Uh, oh well, first of all, this is you know I'm a Californian and this is my life. You know, I, I, that by the time I, the last offer I had from the University of Chicago, I just. I was too entrenched here. I didn't want to do it. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, you've, you've, I guess you're one of the few people who've been here from before the free speech movement as an undergraduate, yes. through graduate school, and then as a, a, a sort of junior faculty through the ranks as well. 
what what changes have you seen in Berkeley over time, and what oh what what sticks out in your mind about the institution itself? Are there things that feel the same? Um, are there things that have changed dramatically? I think Berkeley has changed more than the institution has. Oh, the town of Berkeley. Yeah. I mean, when I first came here, Telegraph Avenue was a real upscale. Uh, <laughs> fancy shops, you know, and <laughs> furniture stores and things like that. <laughs> FSM changed everything. Uh, and downtown Berkeley, of course, and that, that was changed by BART, you know, once we got BART, that very much changed because there used to be nice department stores and things in downtown Berkeley that disappeared. So the city has changed considerably, really hmm. considerably. Hmm. And the campus, you feel like is there well, it gets more and more crowded as buildings go up, but, uh, but otherwise it's, I think, very, pretty much the same. So it's been a pleasure talking to you, Carol, and reliving some <laughs> memories together. And it's uh, been really fun to think back over the years that we've worked together as colleagues. And uh, thank you for the interview. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for putting, I know you're very busy teaching these days, so I thank you very much for your time and for being a good interviewer. <laughs>